is a new video from my series about the exhibition Fantasy pour un palais. I have a piece in this, in this exhibition, a ship, which is part of the Enchanted Island inspired by the pilgrimage to Cythera. I will ha go back on the, this theme of the island and the pilgrimage to Cythera in this video but before I wanted to give you a bit of context of historic context maybe if you are not familiar both with Rococo and with uh, this Rococo storytellers which were really the inspiration for this exhibition and I just wanted to share a bit more of that if you have followed me for quite some time you know I adore Madame Donois who is the main leader of this movement of this literature movement but there were other lady writers of course at the same time who have been completely forgotten, honestly, we can say that. And um, they were the inspiration for the exhibition. So I have a playlist on my channel with all the things I have done in the past related to her fairy tales. I also have a video only about Madame Dolois I made two years ago, so you can watch them if you don't know them already. And uh, here I just wanted to give you a bit more context. I'm not extremely familiar with the other writers, lady writers. I'm going to read them. This is my uh, reading for the rest of the year because I really want to get into more uh, acquainted with all their, their stories. So first, if you're not familiar with the Rococo art era, maybe a bit of context would help you there. So the Rococo era arrived pretty much after the Baroque era which started in the 17th century and the big Rococo style started from uh, 1715 to the mid-century. Uh, some people say uh, 1760, depending on the countries, it, it stopped at a different time and then it was all the classic era which arrived. So if you are very familiar with Marie Antoinette, for example, I know abroad she's really appreciated, really loved, but she doesn't at all belong to the Rococo era. She's much later, she's too classic, the music is different, the art is different, everything is pretty much different at the end and the, the lifestyle is totally different. So there were more craziness at the beginning than at the end. And you could see some Rococo uh, style in every every art actually, in music of course, in, in theatre, in, in uh, opera of course, it was the big big place for all these magical decors and all the fairy tale like decor you could see, which inspired these lady storytellers. Um, you had of course furniture, architecture uh, and painting. And Antoine Watteau in painting was one of the very first Rococo painter actually, who changed a bit the style. So what did it mean in painting? For example, you, you think Rococo, do you do some arabesque everywhere? Uh, what do you do? And actually not, but the style was just more light, more dreamy, more magical. You had more colors. If you have read The Red Color, I told you, you should read by Michel Pastoreau. I mentioned this book in a, in a previous video, in previous favorites video. It's just a great book about all the history of colors. And I mentioned red. And in red, he talked about pink, for example, which arrived in the 18th century. And it's just a Rococo color, uh, completely. Um, Vato was using a lot this color. I did my, my uh, sails pink, actually, for my ship, because it's just the color which was very, very trendy at the time, which changed from the very formal painting of the 17, these very strict lines and strict colors, a bit of heaviness too sometimes. He was just more dreamy and lighted. Um, in Vato's painting, for example, you never have anything real. It's only pretty much, he has one or two paintings which are more inspired by the reality, but for the main part, it's musicians, dancers, actors, people who evolve in a fairy tale world, if you will, and in the pilgrimage to sit there. Are characters who are not totally dressed normally, as you would see in the real world, they have some sort of costumes, um, beautiful colors, a lot of pastel, yellowish, pink, delicate blue, and all his paintings are like that. And all these movements, these very soft movements, are specific to the Rococo painting. And the Rococo was not only sort of curvy, arabesque everywhere, it was not only excess everywhere, because it's you have to be ex uh, in, into excess when you are into Rococo. 
and uh, it was more than that it was also a lifestyle people were obsessed with beauty uh, everything in their life has to be uh, aesthetic of course all this rococo style is not very interesting for peasants for poor people they didn't care very much about that their, their lifestyle was not different from the 17th uh, early 18th or late 18th I think it was pretty much the same so you needed to be very wealthy very rich to allow some rococo madness in your castle in your home in your uh, the way you dressed uh, and in your writings you really needed a lot of money so it was a sort of way of living for very wealthy people. You also had a lot of shepherds, so for example in music, uh, you had a lot of something with, which reminded a lost paradise, an Arcadian paradise, and you tried to recreate that. It was all about recreation. It was the, f the movement of art and, um, and style which was the furthest further away from nature. It's the absolutely opposite of the where we are now, where we should have nothing, we should be close to nature, all that, I, I caricature a bit, but here it was the, the opposite. You were supposed to have uh, an excess and abundance of everything and uh, recreating nature in your home in a completely crazy way. For example, Madame de Pompadour, who was Louis XV's, Louis XV's favorite, she had a conservatory instead of having real flowers, real plants, real trees in this conservatory, she had some porcelain bouquets of flowers, bouquet of uh, flowers made from porcelain, and the servants were spraying some real fragrance from real flowers on these porcelain flowers every day. You were just imitating nature in a completely sometimes absurd way too it went to a completely madness at some point and then it has to it was everything was starting to be completely decadent so the classicism arrived and something closer to nature and all that at this time it was not that it was uh, something completely different in the in the visit we had of the exhibition with a journalist a journalist asked to Francis who is the curator of the exhibition what's the difference between baroque and rococo and there were a few differences, of course, because the Baroque started much earlier. But not only that, uh, he said it's just the, la preciosité du Baroque, it's the most precious part of the Baroque era. Um, and maybe a bigger attention to details. You go just further. I had an idea in my mind that Rococo was just always the excess of the Baroque. You, you have uh, no limits of any kind. You're supposed to mix all genre together. You mix the, the flowers with the animals. Uh, there are a lot of ornaments which come from the sea and the sea world. And everything has to mix together without any, any order, any organization, any symmetry. So it's pretty much a great freedom to create for a Rococo project. Um, it's completely different from the first Baroque era when things were you had these curvy shapes or that, but this was very strict. So in the Rococo era, you can do what you want and you have to do it uh, with an ex uh, excessive way. And the lady writers were, of course, um, very in the, under the influence of all that, of the opera, of course, and all the magic brought to France by Italian and the Italian sets. By the way, in the exhibition, there are two beautiful decors, opera miniatures, if you will, opera decors uh, from the 18th century that you should really uh, be interested in if you go to see it. It's really, really nice, just real one from the 18th century. And they were very much under the influence of what they saw at, on the stage at the opera house in the way they make the characters appear from the sky, on the clouds, on, on all sorts of crazy machines and all that. I'm going to mention a book, but I keep it for my Rococo haul coming at the end of this series. Uh, I'm going to read, I told you, because um, there were all the other lady storytellers I'm not familiar with and I want to catch up with my um, the things I don't know. So the other lady writers were Mademoiselle de Lubert, for example, there was Mademoiselle L'Héritier, uh, Le Chevalier de Marie, few men too were writing fairy tales, Mademoiselle de la Force, and of course Madame le Prince de Beaumont who arrived a bit later. And all 
those stories were actually gathered together at the end of the 18th century, just before the revolution in 1785 by the Chevalier de Mayer, uh, who wanted to gather all these stories before they disappeared really. People were not very interested in these stories anymore very much at this time, but he tried to gather them in a collection of I think 44 books uh, from all these sort of strange stories which are not always a lot of links together, some very good authors, some less good ones, but uh, it was the first time it was all put together under the name of Cabinet des Fées, which remind very much uh, the Cabinet de Curiosité, the Curiosity Cabinet, so like something which, with a lot of strange objects put together. And by the way, the Brothers Grimm, which, who arrived later in the 19th century, they knew these books. They knew these books, they gathered German stories around them, but they were familiar with some of these stories. They were told, removing all the Rococo aspect, of course. They removed all that. It was not the trend to, to have some extremely detailed descriptions of crazy palaces and all that. So they just kept the structure, the stories, and they used them too. So it's interesting to know that um, they had access to them and they used them and of course they also uh, gathered uh, materials from their own country. But Madame Donoir was the very first to have a written version of a fairy tale. Fairy tale always existed of course, but they were said, they were retold, they were not written in a written form and she was the first one to do that uh, before Charles Perrault. And Charles Perrault was interesting, it's the only thing really he's very famous for now and he was not at all a fairy tale writer. He did many other very serious things and the things we know him for now are his fairy tales. So it's interesting. Also interesting to know, I think, is all this lady, fairy tale writers, are all forgotten now. Madame Donoy is just a bit, but not very much published because her fairy tales are very long and their stories seem probably too sophisticated for our way of seeing life right now. And I think it's a shame they are really some beautiful creativity and of course they use the structure of basic fairy tale, which is always the same even all over the world, but just add, I just like this precious aspect they give to the stories with the very detailed description of castles, of islands, of grotto, mysterious grotto, which is used in the exhibition, uh, mirror cabinets, all that, all the things they saw in their real life, because some people could have that around them, some wealthy people could have created these wonderful places in their home. Also interesting to know, all these literature, these stories, are sort of the work of aristocrats, the fairy tales, after that in the 19th century, like maybe literature in general, was more uh, used by pretty much not every sort of people, but it was not a sort of aristocrats fairy tales. It was really, uh, the Grimm were not aristocrats and Andersen was certainly not an aristocrat either. So it's just um, interesting that this world were, uh, that these fairy tales uh, were written by ladies who live in a sort of bubble. They were very far from, from real life actually, really, really far. And this you cannot totally forget that at the beginning of Louis XIV's era, he created all this magic in Versailles. He, of course, he had the possibility to do that. So a lot of people have seen that. Maybe they had a bit of nostalgia of that, but they were just inspired to recreate that. It was the turning of the century was maybe a bit hard on people. The end of uh, Louis XIV's era were very dark and hard and strict and all that. And the Rococo was there just to add a bit of lightness into that. The colors were more cheerful. Uh, the Rococo style, including the fairy tales, um, I think there is something really uh, happy into that. You can tell in the um, Vatos painting, for example, you don't see a lot of sadness or all that. With the Romantic era, it's very, very different. I found that the Rococo is just like something cheerful and light and dreamy. But I see the Rococo style as something just surprising and you, you have to be surprised and to see unexpected things. And um, yes, and it cheer you up. So for the exhibition, for the Enchanted Island, I created a Rococo ship, which was inspired by the pilgrimage to Cythera by Antoine Watteau. So in these two versions of his paintings, one is um, at Le Louvre in Paris, the other is in Berlin, you don't really see a, a ship. You see one in one of the versions, in the other it's very difficult to see. You don't really see things. Things are just evocated and I had to do 
well, the ship which could bring all these people to the Isle of Citera. By the way, we don't know in the painting if they are living or if they are going. There are a lot of theory about, about this painting, which is very mysterious. It's very beautiful, very dreamy, but you don't really know if it's uh, they are sad to leave or happy to go. I will also link another video, a very nice video I found in English about this painting and the. Um, I don't know if there were art historians who were talking about that, but it was very, very interesting. So I will link just that uh, under the video if you want to know more about Vato and about his beautiful paintings. So I did what I thought a Rococo artist would do and I just create a lot of gold and I had my pink, of course, sails and all that. And I put some animals and um, horses one mixed in the, in the ship just to recreate this uh, magical atmosphere of the Rococo sculpting. I will, no, no worries, I will give you all my references. By the way, I just used to create this video, mainly the, the, the work that Francis, the curator of the exhibition, has done about all this work. Francis Sadou, who is the curator of the exhibition, he prepared a lot of work for us, uh, for those who were taking part of the exhibition, so that we, we would learn more about the context. I knew already a bit of that because I, I love that. I, it's my favorite part of our art and history. Uh, but it was super interesting to read that. Thank you very much for watching this video. I have another video coming with the Wokoko Hall and also the visit of the castle, uh, which is not totally related to the exhibition, but as the exhibition takes place in this castle, maybe you would like to see it. And I was really happy to uh, visit it after the exhibition with a journalist last week and it was really nice so i'm sharing a bit my visit with you uh, in a separated video you can give a thumbs up if you liked what you saw i hope you are going to see it really and you're going to enjoy it it takes place till march 22 uh, 2020 so you have some time to prepare your trip i will link below the links to my blog post and to the castle so you can organize your visit, your trip if you want to come. It's easy, it's not difficult at all. In public transport it's super easy. Uh, it's not far from Paris at all. You can go and you can enjoy a really nice um, afternoon in this castle, in this place and in the exhibition too because it's really worth seeing. You can subscribe to the channel if you don't want to miss all the next videos. I also have after that my Christmas series coming and for now I will leave you here and I wish you a beautiful day. Et en fait, ça vous donne une idée, parce que là, on est vraiment sur les tomates des potes, les escaliers.